warm. It's been snowing and it's kind of cold out there. So how about this view? It's a nice warm sand beach, tropical waters. You got a pool all around your boat. You can jump off and go snorkeling anytime you want, go swimming. Maybe go spear fishing. Lots of beautiful fish underneath the water. So this is what Mike and I envisioned when we thought about going cruising. And it's what we were really excited about. Get out warmer water. And so we're going to tell you about our story, how we made it happen, and hopefully this will help you cast the battle lines off your boat and go into some bigger waters too. How many of you sail right now? Great, got a good crowd. How many are you going out in power boats? Okay, a couple. Well, I asked both questions because we saw all different kinds of boats in the Bahamas. You can do it on sail or power boats. And how many of you have gone to the Caribbean or someplace warm sailing your boating? Okay, good support. And how many have thought about cruising for either a little bit or an extended period of your time? A couple of you. Great, yeah. So we all think about it. We all think about taking that trip, leaving our job. And so Mike and I thought about it. We made it happen. And we're excited to tell you our story. So we'll talk about it. I don't know, do I really need a microphone? Probably not, really. The, uh, kind of the overall theme of the message today is that it's easier to do than you think. And there's a lot of excuses out there for, for not taking a year off or not taking this plunge. And, and I think that's kind of the message today, is that anyone can do it, regardless of budget, or regardless of what boat you may be contemplating doing it on. So we're going to start out and talk about how did this trip come to be for us? Why did we decide to kind of take this path less travel? travel? And then we'll get into the details. So the pre-departure stuff. How did we kind of come up with a budget for all this? How did we pick a boat? Where did we go? And then where did we actually go? And some of the highlights and lowlights of that trip. Um, one of the biggest questions everyone always asks about this is how on earth did you afford this? What did it actually cost? So we'll go ahead and share some actual dollars and cents of what we spent. And that's not to say this is the only way to do it. Just like Jenny said, we saw people doing this on every budget, on every type of boat imaginable. So this is just kind of one glimpse into what we did. And then lastly, we'll end up with some lessons learned. So as Jenny said, my name's Mike. I'm an electrical engineer by training and work at Honeywell right now. And as we'll talk about a little bit more, was fortunate enough to be able to leave, officially quit the job, and come back and uh, get rehired, which was a huge relief. Um, as far as sailing goes, I grew up in the Denver area, and believe it or not, I actually did learn to sail on a couple of little puddles that are out there in the Colorado, Nebraska area. And that was mostly just small boat sailing, uh, sunfish type stuff. My dad had a Hobie Cat and did a little bit of that sort of sailing. but. Pretty basic. I mean, I could get a sailboat across the lake, and that was about it. You know, beyond that, as I learned later in life, uh, I wasn't much of a sailor. When I got to the Twin Cities here, I was talking to a colleague actually that just walked in the door here, and he introduced me to SCUM, the Sailing Club of the University of Minnesota, which unfortunately they did away with that great name and went uh, to the TC Sailing Club. And I got involved with that because it was a great way to have access to boats for dirt cheap. And one thing led to another and started doing some racing um, down there at Lake Harriet in association with the Lake Harriet Yacht Club. And uh, one thing led to another. The trip put together a charter trip up to Lake Superior through Superior Charters, which I think has an exhibition here. And, uh, you know, getting on that bigger boat just had this moment that, man, this is Great. I could live on a boat like this. I mean, and how novel is that to take your home with you and where could you go? And, and so that novelty just really kind of grabbed me. And from there, I, the engineer in me started saying, man, how could I make this a reality? And that for me started with what does that spreadsheet look like? And how do I budget for this? And what would it really cost? And how good of a boat, how expensive of a boat would it take, um, et cetera. And then in the midst of that, some more charter trips kind of came in, and we did a charter trip with a group of friends down to the British Virgin Islands. So I had a little bit different background. I learned to sail in Clear Lake, Iowa. Yes, there's lakes among all the cornfields. <laughs> Dad got me into sailing. He introduced me to a small X-boat, about 12 feet long, and enrolled me in sailing classes. And eventually I started teaching the sailing classes, too, to all the little five, six, seven, eight-year-old kids. 
great job for during high school and college for the summer student. And I also was racing on the boat. I was the skipper and I had a friend as the crew. So weekends we would be out. And then I graduated from that, went to an e-scout, 28 feet long. Again, I was a skipper, and this time Dad was crew, so we involved the family. And then I was needing to get a real job, and I decided that I wanted to move to Minneapolis. Bigger city, more opportunities, and of course, there's more lakes, right? I could, I could continue sailing and racing. So I moved to Minneapolis, and I joined the Minnesota Women's Sailing Team. We have some members back there. And with the women's sailing team, I learned about crewing, and I also learned about a bigger boat, which is the J-22. We race a lot, Thursday, Saturdays, and Sundays. You know, in Minnesota, you can race almost every day of the week, compared to just the weekends in Iowa. But we were out there on Lake Minnetonka through the Wyzetta Yacht Club racing, and the women's sailing team gave me an opportunity to see what it would be like to actually be involved in more of the ownership of sailing. So we were involved in making upgrades to boat, repairs, making sure the bills are paid, the slip fees. And this gave me some good insight so I could be more of an active player when Mike and I decided to take our cruise. And then from there, my parents were interested in taking some courses, kind of another big boat class, navigation. They took that through Tom Burns, Northern Breezes. And I was interested too, you know, I gotta keep up with my parents. So I enrolled in the class, from, some friends joined me and we kept taking more classes through Northern Breezes. And we got our bare boat charter certification, and with that we decided, well, let's put this to use. Every year, let's take a trip down to the Caribbean, warmer weather, you know, we've got to get away from the Minnesota snow in March. And since then we have, every year we've made some trips. And that led us, Mike and I, to meet. We were at a party after one of the British Virgin Island charter trips. He was on a different boat than I was. But we were at a party together talking and sharing pictures, and we had a conversation. Our first one was about, have you, have you ever thought of being on a boat and cruising for a, a longer period of time and living on a boat? So from there, you know, we continued on. We did more sailing. We went, took a trip with some friends to St. Martin in 2009. And later that year, we decided to tie the knot. And the annual trip came with friends. We took the trip to the Spanish Virgin Islands. And kind of at this time, we were continuing thinking about our trip. And after talking with some friends, some friends that have done some traveling before, you know, that have taken a year off and explored a little bit more, talking with them, you know, let's make a trip. Let's make a trip happen. Let's do it while we're young. We don't have a lot of logistic issues to sort out. We don't have kids, um, we're healthy, so it's easier to, to get back into the real world with that. We did have a house, so that was one logistic that we needed to work out. But let's think about making it now versus later when we retire. So we're thinking about it, so now we're in the planning phase. So we need to plan our budgeting, what kind of boat we're going to buy, and what kind of upgrades we want to make to that boat. So budgeting, as I mentioned, this was a lot of different spreadsheets of kind of contingency planning of, all right, if we sell the house, what would happen? If we keep the house and make payments on that, how much do we have to save for that? And in the meantime, we're kind of saving as we go through some of this, you know, dreaming and uh, fantasizing about eventually doing this. But really, the big questions that are the drivers for a spreadsheet like this or a budget like this is, how long are you going to do it? Are you retiring for the rest of your life? Or are you going for a week? Um, obviously, those are totally different things to plan for. Um, what do you do with the uh, expenses at home? Do you keep the house? We elected to kind of baseline that plan, and we figured into the overall budget that, all right, we're going to keep the house. How can we you know, bankroll that situation? Um, and as it turned out, we actually got really fortunate in that regard that some friends happened to be moving to Minnesota at the time, and it's a huge help of at least covering a large fraction of those expenses. And then what is the scope of your trip? Are you going to just cruise up and down the St. Croix or maybe do a week-long cruise in Lake Superior? Or are you going to circumnavigate the boats that that require and the cost? You know, are you a big, expensive blue water sail sailboat? Or are you a fairly simple canoe and you're going to camp every night? And any of those are possible. And quite frankly, we saw people in all of those categories as we did this. Uh, so for us, 
the, and this was somewhat naive, the boat cost, and this was basically based on what I saw on Yacht World, kind of what was the cheapest that looked halfway decent. <laughs> and it turned out to be kind of that $50,000 price point. And, you know, 2010 was a nice time to be buying a sailboat from, in the used market. The, the prices were pretty depressed. And that, you know, that turned out great. That's a, it, almost exactly what we spent, and we had budgeted maybe 10000 in upgrades. We probably spent a little bit more than that in the end. And then as I had mentioned, home expenses, we kind of baselined that, all right, we're going to figure out how to keep the house and come back, you know, in this one to two year time frame. Living expenses, kind of the day to day, one of the things we learned is that it's pretty doggone cheap to live on a sailboat when you're not staying in marinas every night. If you're just anchoring out, you don't have rent payments, you're not paying utilities, and you, you have essentially food and fuel that you're paying for on just a month-to-month -month basis, and that can be pretty inexpensive if you want it. So now it's the time where we need to buy a boat, and when we were in process of doing that, I remember laying in bed and Mike reading to me from John Cashmere's Use Boat Notebook about all the different boats that we could buy within our budget range. So this was a good resource for us. We decided to go to Annapolis to look at boats. This is the sailing capital of the world. Of course, we should be able to find a boat within two weeks there. So we took some vacation time off work, went to Annapolis around July, looked at about 15 to 20 boats. A lot of different varieties, ones that needed a lot of repairs, and ones that needed some. Within our price range, there was always going to be some work that we need to put into it. So we decided to focus on this Hunter 40 version and looked at two different boats and we decided to make an offer and it was accepted and then we went into the sea trial and the survey and that was good, we wanted to continue and move forward. Within a couple weeks the boat was ours. So here are some pictures of Windermere. Windermere there, the keel is 5.9 feet and really roomy and open on the top. You'll see the aft cabin in the back. You can get around it on both sides, which is different for most boats. But there's more room in the, in the aft cabin, which kind of has a reciprocal. It limits the room that you have in your cockpit for storage. So when you're picking boats, there's always trade-offs. You can't seem to have everything. The favorite conversation as we met cruisers, and we met tons of people doing this. It's always important uh, that there's this subculture of people doing uh, every activity you can imagine, and cruising is no different. The ICW, there's this migration of seafaring folks that go up and down every year. But by far, the favorite conversation when you meet another cruiser is to start talking about equipment and, you know, what gadgets do you have? And I mean, that's quite frankly why we have the boat show here today, right? Because we have all these companies making cool gadgets and we all want to go buy them. Um, and so I'm going to talk about a little bit about what our vessel Windermere had, but more importantly what it didn't. And again, this is with the theme that you can do this, that it's easier to do than, than you might think. But the real, I mean, Windermere was pretty bare bones. The one kind of uh, nice piece of equipment we had was refrigeration. Aside from that, as far as water makers, we didn't have all that stuff. But refrigeration was the one that we did have, and that consumes a fair amount of power, so we had two ways of charging that, and that was through an alternator, a nice big old alternator on the diesel itself. And then we ended up buying just a simple Honda 2000 watt generator that we would be able to run for an hour or two every day to charge up the battery bits. Um, we did have a chart plotter that came with the boat. It was a fairly nice Garmin color chart plotter. plotter. Um, and then a VHF, we bought a brand new VHF that we put on the boat up in Haverford Grace in the northern Chesapeake and uh, autopilot. That is, was one of the other big things that was certainly nice to have. It had a nice uh, Raymarine under, under deck autopilot. And when we were doing the longer crossings um, with just the two of us, that was certainly nice to have. But what didn't we have? And the fun gadgets that everyone loves talking about is we didn't have a water maker, we didn't have a uh, wind generator and solar panels and um, all this other fancy stuff, electronic charts there, you know, so we did have that nice chart plotter um, and we looked at getting the, the electronic charts all the way into the Bahamas and it was, you know, 500 or 1,000 bucks. We said, ah, heck with it, you know, we can get by with a $20 chart book. And we didn't really regret it in the end either. Uh, we didn't have a single sideband hot water heater, 
the boat had a hot water heater on it, and as we were starting to work on it in, in uh, the Chesapeake, we realized it was leaking, and instead of going out and doing this, let's just go. Um, and again, we can argue whether we really missed that or not, and Jenny will talk a little bit more about that. But, <laughs> but the takeaway here is that all these fancy gadgets that we're hawking here today at the boat show, they're, they're really cool, and if your pockets are deep, they're great. But if, uh, if you want to have that cruise and you want to do it right now and that budget doesn't allow for all these fancy gadgets, they're really not the essential. So now we have a boat and it comes to the big question, if we really want to start cruising here in a couple months in the fall, September, October, we need to go. We need to get to our boat and start working on it. So the next task on our list was to quit our jobs. Well, quitting a job, this is pretty untraditional, not very common. It's kind of nerve-wracking, especially with the economy that we have. You know, for us to quit a job when many people are trying to look for work it was kind of different. And then also, the aspect that we're young and usually we're working toward the corporate ladder, kind of working our way up. And at retirement is when you would go cruising. Why would you do it now? So we had those kind of social obstacles that we were thinking about, but we had thought about this. We budgeted. We got the boat. We need to go. Let's make it happen. So. We talked with our employers, and we talked about the opportunity of having our jobs available for us when we returned. Unfortunately, that wasn't possible, but we did leave on good terms. So when we returned, Mike was able to secure the same job, same company, and my company did not have any openings at that time within my field. So I am out there looking for the next dream job. So boat upgrades, and this was kind of part of, we were buying an old boat, we knew we were going to be working on it, and that was part of this whole deal, and part of the fun and, and the adventure of this whole sabbatical that we did. Um, and so, what all did we do? A number of things came up in the survey, as you would imagine with a 20-year-old boat, 25-year-old boat. A lot of the stuff that fits into the deferred maintenance category. Um, but here's a list of some of the bigger dollar items, or bigger time items, that we put into the boat. Um, so this was a Chesapeake Bay-based uh, vessel, and it had a pretty simple anchoring setup that we wanted something beefier. So we ended up spending a chunk of money on a chain, a big chain, and a Manson Supreme anchor. Uh, we ended up buying a dinghy, a fancy apex dinghy that was rigid and inflatable that we ended up loving. We certainly spent more than we had planned or budgeted there, uh, but it was invaluable in the Bahamas. I mean, it really is your car getting around and going fishing and uh, exploring. Uh, we added dinghy davits. The rudder post had its upper attach point, had a wooden bulkhead where it had some pretty serious water damage that the surveyor wanted addressed, and that involved us learning all about West Systems epoxy and uh, doing quite a bit of fiberglass work, and mainly time more than money. Mixing elbow, again, kind of that deferred maintenance type of item. The stove on this boat was CNG, which is a great option from a safety standpoint, but we were a little bit concerned of the availability of CNG as you cruise down the ICW. From what we had read and research was pretty limited, so we ended up converting it to propane. So that was all planned, and you know that kind of fit into the schedule. First time we put her in the water, um, of course, we've got leaks everywhere, and it's all of the stuff that's not planned. Most of those were pretty easily addressed by, uh, you know, tightening some through through holes or rebedding a couple of through holes. Uh, but one of the bigger ones is we went out motoring, and the water lift muffler had cracked, probably as I had put on the new uh, or mixing elbow, and so that was a bit of a bear that we didn't plan for because that involved pretty much lifting the engine out of the way, getting <coughs> under there, and fiberglass repairing that water lift muffler. A uh, hot water heater we had, uh, I sort of alluded to, uh, when we went out as well, it was leaking. It's like, ah, you know, heck with it, let's just tear the thing out. We'll fill it with, as it turned out, we filled it with a few cases of canned green beans. I'm not sure what the trade-off is on that one. But. A couple of pictures, putting a coat of bottom paint on, the, on her as she was sitting on the hard when we first got there. And uh, crawling in some lazarettes, doing some of that fun fiberglass work there on the right. Uh, part of part of boat ownership, I guess. So, what's a takeaway here? That if you wait until everything's done and you have everything checked out on your list, almost guaranteed you will never leave 
Um, and that was a piece of advice that we got from numerous people on numerous occasions. It's, I mean, you can really work on a boat forever and never leave. And if you want to go, you know, you got to draw the line somewhere. And it's definitely possible to do some things underway. We were able to do some of the limited stuff, like refinishing teak while we were just motoring down the ICWs on calm, on calm days. Uh, this whole infrastructure of cruisers moving up and down the East Coast creates this network of West Marines that are everywhere, and we never had trouble finding a West Marine if we needed one. And then a lot of these consignment stores where there's cruisers that are starting and stopping and selling stuff, and so we were able to pick up all sorts of used goods along the way. And then there's, you know, repairs that happen under, you know, when we were in the middle of the Bahamas. This brand new VHF we bought comped out, so we ended up replacing that and chasing new wires through the mast. You know, we did that while we were at anchor. And again, part of, part of what you're signing up for when you do something. So now we're going to get into a few details about our trip, where we went, and the activities that we did in the East Coast as well as in the Bahamas, and how we crossed the Gulf Stream. So we started in Haver de Grace. This is the northernmost city of the Chesapeake. And we went all the way through the Chesapeake, all the big body of water, down to Norfolk, Virginia, where we caught the Intercoastal Waterway and the Intercoastal Waterway, the ICW, it is a 3,000 mile connection of waterways, inlets, bays, sounds, on the Atlantic and the Gulf Coast. And many people can do the loop, is what they call, just going along the ICW. Well, we just took the ICW down to Miami, but we uh, wanted to go offshore a couple times for the experience of it, and also to make some miles. So we went offshore between North Carolina and South Carolina, as well as Savannah on the outside of Georgia. So all those little anchors is the intercoastal waterway? That was our route. And all the anchors are our route where we stopped, some anchorages that we went through. But yes, that's the edge of the intercoastal waterway so on were, the Atlantic side. You were actually side. on the intercoastal going all the way through there? Correct. Okay. Yes. Uh, but we did hop out on the outside a couple of times. You can see our, our route there in the purple correct okay. um, and I also want to mention that on the intercoastal waterway another reason that we wanted to jump out was because there's a couple complications of the intercoastal waterway first you have the bridges so there's traffic that goes across from the shore side and you have to time yourself on the bridges appropriately otherwise you're going to be sitting and waiting for an hour which we had that happen once Otherwise, we planned it pretty well, and then you also have the tides and the currents that you have to go either with or you're going against. So you also have to time on when you're going to go through those inlets. And as well in the intercoastal, one of the probably the biggest things is that it can be shallow in some spots. The Corps of Engineers doesn't get to every spot in that three miles, three thousand miles. So there are going to be some shallow spots where you might hit bottom. Plus the weather, it might move the bottom. So even if you are following your GPS and you're on that magenta line, you might run aground. And that did happen to us. One more question. Are you actually sailing in the intercoastal water? Good question. On the intercoastal way, you can sail in some spots. Uh, some are wide. There's bays and there's sounds. Mm -hmm. So you can sail across a long body of water to catch kind of another canal. Right. And there's some times when you're just motoring. And if you're in a canal, you don't have a lot of wind to go back and forth with, uh, so you might be just motoring that entire day. Because I lived in Fort Lauderdale, I just couldn't see how you could sail. Right, right. There's certainly spots. Sailing, probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. And which is another reason why a lot of people like to go offshore, is to make more miles. You can only go about 50 miles in a day in the intercoastal waterway, but you can go 100 miles if you go offshore into the ocean. Yeah, but the intercoastal, the advantages of it is that it's more protective. You're, you're inside and you have, you don't have to battle the weather as much as you would if you were out in the open sea and all the hazard weather that you can experience out there. Sure. So you just have to off way. What do you want to do? How many miles do you want to take in that time period? So we crossed down <coughs> through Miami and we crossed into the Bahamas and 50 miles across from Miami to Bimini, really easy to jump across, um, not very far. We wanted to go to the Exumas, that was our chosen spot. We heard a lot about it, a lot of fun activities that you can do there. There's some uninhabited islands and there's some small settlements. 
So we got to experience both. We could anchor in some islands where nobody else was. It was just us. We needed to go down to Georgetown to upgrade our immigration form. We first got 30 days, and we needed to be there four months. So we had to ask customs, can we please be here another four months? Um, so that's something that all cruisers have to do. And then Georgetown, it's a bigger city, so there was going to be a grocery store there. Well, great, we can get some fresh produce. We don't have to eat the can of green beans anymore. And as well as Georgetown, it's considered kind of an adult Disneyland. A lot of cruisers go here, and they might spend the whole winter at Georgetown on the island because there's so many activities. You can do volleyball on the beach. You can do softball on the beach. You can bring your crafts, maybe go to an art class. There's beach church on Sunday. Maybe have a burger at Chat and Chill. So a lot of activities and a neat, fun place. But after about three months in the Exumas, we decided that, you know, we should probably explore the Bahamas a little bit more, make it worthwhile for our time. So we considered um, going to the other islands. We went to Long Island, got to meet a lot of locals during our hitchhiking days. And we went to Dean's Blue Hole, which is the largest seawater blue hole in the world, about 600 feet. And we continued on to the Gementos. If you like lobster, this is where the lobster commercial fishing is happening. And we went to Gementos, did some fishing there, caught some fish and lobster, and saw some different fish that we had never seen before. Conception Island is an island that is uninhabited and it's protected. So it's very pristine, a lot of blue, shallow waters to go across and long beach walks. We have some pictures later of Conception. Cat Island, there's some smaller settlements here. The highest point of the Bahamas is here in Cat Island. And it's 206 feet. So the Bahamas are mostly a small, flat uh, body of islands. But at the top of that point is the Hermitage. It's a small monastery that was built. And Eleuthera and the Abacos are more um, well known. They're the northern region. Many British loyalists came to these islands and settled here after the American Revolutionary War. So there's a lot of history and a lot of families that are still living there today. Maybe they did the boat building, and you can hear about their family history and how it's developing and changing. The Abacos is a very common spot. Not a lot of tourists you know, from America or maybe Europe come over to the Abacos because it's more developed. You have airports that you can fly into easily. There's a lot of vacation homes that you can go to, villages, cottages, more restaurants. It's just a nice way to get out and explore the Bahamas, but yet you still have a lot of the amenities. So we finished in the Abacos and we went considered um, continue north. So overall with our trip, we were one month fixing up the boat, three months cruising down the intercoastal waterway, four and a half months in the Bahamas, and then we took a month and a half to get back to the U.S., up to Baltimore, where we put the boat up for sale and left it at the end of June. And we have our mileage there. This is one of the last shots of our GPS. 2,684 miles, but average speed about five knots. <laughs> <laughs> so we covered a lot of ground, saw a lot. It was very slow and relaxing. A topic that comes up that I'll just say a couple words is crossing the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is a pretty amazing natural phenomenon. It's this giant river in the middle of the ocean, essentially. And it flows quite swiftly. Um, it can flow as fast as four to five knots. And as you just saw, we're in a boat that has an average speed of about five knots. And so it does take a little bit of planning when you uh, tackle a crossing of the, the Gulf Stream. And the easiest way to think of that is, all right, say we're trying to go up river, up the Gulf Stream, and it's flowing at four and a half knots, and we're moving at four and a half knots, we're going absolutely nowhere, right? And uh, so a couple of the, obviously, you can't do that. So you can't cross from northern Florida to the southern Bahamas in any kind of reasonable fashion. So that's one thing that is always recommended. Um, another interesting thing is whenever you get these large currents that flow tidally in the Bahamas or the Gulf Stream or even a river, and when that opposes the flow of the wind, the waves that result can be pretty ugly and 
extremely uncomfortable to be in. And pretty much everything you read about crossing the Gulf Stream says, don't even attempt to go out in the stream when there is any northerly component. The Gulf Stream is again flowing up. It's the warm water that's flowing all the way up through the Caribbean. It gets channeled into the Straits of Florida there, and that's where it's compressed and flowing at the, the fastest point. Um, and then this last one here is don't try to go in a straight line, which is a little bit counterintuitive. Why don't you go to the next one? And the way, if you use your fancy Raymarine autopilot and GPS that you buy out here today, and you tell it to, let's follow the rum line from Miami in a perfectly straight line to Bimini, um, a couple interesting things are going to happen. So you're going to point the bow, pull it out of Miami directly at Bimini, and you're going to travel your way across. And you're going to get out here in about the middle of the stream. And that's, remember, the stream's flowing at four and a half knots, and your boat can move through the water at four and a half knots, let's say. So now, in order to stay on this line, your autopilot's going to turn you exactly perpendicular to where you're trying to go, Bimini over here. And what happens is your velocity made good, your VMG drops to zero. So in that hypothetical situation, you're stuck right here. Your autopilot never lets you move beyond that. So what all of the stuff you read about says when you're trying to do the stream crossing is take a bite. And this bite can be pretty big where you, instead of pointing your bow at Bimini when you pull out of Miami, you're pointing maybe 30 degrees south and hold that heading for the entire crossing. And what happens is you end up forming this S curve um, that you can see in our chart plotter right here. And this was right as we crossed over to Bimini. And again, you know, right at that average speed. We're getting nowhere fast here. So some of our activities as we are traveling down the intercoastal waterway were based a lot of sightseeing and things that you do as an American tourist. We saw a lot of history sites, Revolutionary War, American uh, Civil War. We went to some plantations, Cape Canaveral. This was a great opportunity for us to sightsee, but as well get used to the boat. You know, something that as far as living as you're traveling versus just living at the marina. So we got to really test out how things are working, make sure we have the right number of supplies and materials on board. And then also to do some restocking. You know, we went to the grocery store a couple times, bought more canned food. You know, filled up three grocery carts, the most that we've ever purchased in our lives before. So it really helped us to get acclimated to the boat and be ready to be self-sufficient because in the Bahamas, you do have some grocery stores, but they don't have a lot of the foods that you need. They don't have a lot of the produce that's, that's fresh. And you certainly don't have the Home Depot or the Menards in the Bahamas. You might have some small, you know, fix-it stores. Maybe they carry a few supplies, but everything comes from the U.S. and the Bahamas. So we needed to bring everything that we wanted with us. Going down the ICW, we met a lot of cruisers as well. We partake in, in the Thanksgiving meal. And this was about over 100 cruisers that came together. And you should see the spread that they all put together on their boats and then brought to this hotel that we kind of rented out for our meal. And it was just fantastic. We learned a lot about other cruising organizations, different ways that cruisers can connect, learn about sailing, learn about where to go, learn about things that are good to have on your boat and things that you might not need. So it's a very social organization and very helpful, so the big cruising family. As we continued down the ICW, we updated our blog, did a lot of reading and journals, and it was getting colder as we went to Florida. Go figure, you know, I guess the weather was different, but we did have a lot of inside time when we were done with our sailing day. And we traveled the ICW in three months, and that's not typically normal, but it was our first time. Many people can travel it, and they go on the outside, and it could take maybe two weeks. Here are some pictures. We have Annapolis up here, the canyons in Charleston, and Norfolk, battleships, and then the space shuttle. We almost saw one take off at Cape Canaveral. It was delayed, though. The Bahamas was totally different. When we're going down the ICW, quite frankly, there was a few times it's like, oh my gosh, why are we doing this? We're freezing to death. We spent money like crazy. We're continuing to spend money fixing all this stuff. And we kind of weren't having a ton of fun. And maybe part of that is figuring out, uh, Jenny could maybe do a few more uh, museums than I could handle. And so that starts to get old for me. And uh, 
suddenly we cross to the Bahamas and it's totally different. And instead of this murky, cold, ugly looking water, it's this beautiful blue, transparent water everywhere. It's warm out. Um, I mean, we were literally freezing when we left Miami. We had all our layers on. I mean, and it was, it was funny actually when you listen to Noah in Miami and they're saying, yeah, it's supposed to get cold tonight. Make sure you put mittens on and, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> um, but it was quite cold, especially when we didn't, I mean, we didn't have any heat on the boat or anything. And so we left Miami and we pull into Bimini and it's just a total different world. But this underwater world is really what we focus on, and you'll notice here in the couple pictures we show that, I mean, that's what we latched onto, and the, the fishing, the spear fishing, we didn't know we were going to gravitate towards the spear fishing when we left, but man, we sure did enjoy it and realize how much fun we had with that. And uh, part of that is you have time for stuff that we didn't have time for before, and so we catch all these fish, and now we cook them up and figure out fun ways to cook those and uh, bake some bread to go with it. And, just a lot of fun activities. A few other ones again, the reading, journaling, blogging, you know, that was fun. Uh, beaches, there's all these beaches and everything you could possibly imagine washes up on a beach, anything that floats anyway. Everything from parts of the space shuttle to fishing nets and uh, everything else. And so that was kind of fun to see what you could scrounge up and build and put together. All right, so here's some of the, uh, sure. Was that the blue hole? Yes, it was, yeah, that was Dean's wow. blue hole, yeah. Uh, so here's some of the, you know, the fun we, we had, and you definitely notice the theme here. This is right, right there. You can, actually, if you look really closely at the chart plotter we showed a minute ago, you'll see a little notch where we had to, we stopped and chased this guy down to get him on board, and he went right in the uh, Gulf Stream. Um, so that got us pretty excited. That was the first time we had put the line out, and uh, you know, it was very fun and very exciting because we didn't really know what we were doing from a fishing standpoint, and we kind of got lucky. Um, and then as we did more of the spear fishing and snorkeling, we started to figure out how to get these lobsters aboard. And we were using uh, a Hawaiian sling mainly um, to, to get these guys and you just hunt around, look for them under ledges, and can eventually uh, um, we got to where we were pretty much having lobster most of the meals uh, when lobster <laughs> was in season, which was pretty cool, pretty unique. And here's a particularly good day uh, spear fishing where we, we got quite a few underwater creatures. Probably got to the point where we were getting more food than we really could justify eating, but we had plenty of seafood. Uh, a few more pictures. Here you can kind of see this. Uh, I'm actually, it's tough to see here probably from the back, but there's a lobster right there, and I have the Hawaiian sling on or using the Hawaiian sling to spear this lobster. This is unusual for a lobster to be out in the open like this. Usually they're tucked under something, but this kind of makes for a good picture. Sharks, we have a few shark stories, and maybe if we have a little bit more time at the end, we can tell some, but uh, when you're spearing, especially and putting blood and flopping fish in the water, that's exactly what the sharks are attracted to. And there was a couple times where we made ourselves nervous, and then a lot of the books you read as well talk have some pretty scary stories in it, so it doesn't take much to get a little bit scared there. Um, every type of underwater animal you can imagine. Um, you know, here's a turtle we saw down in the Abacos. I think this is conception here, I mean, just particularly beautiful beaches, and, and to have this beach all to yourself is pretty, pretty unique and uh, was pretty fun for us. So that kind of lets, goes into the highlights, and that remoteness here is probably one of the big ones um, for us. Is it, you know, we've done some camping, and we ended up doing a little bit of road touring and road tripping at the end of this. And it's really hard in our society now to get remote and have, you know, you go to the national parks and it's this beautiful natural area, but you end up camping 10 feet away from, you know, somebody else. And so the cruising and living on a sailboat for a year was very unique that we could truly pull up to an island and that be our personal island for, for a week. Um, and, you know, that, that was very rewarding, very neat. We were living simply. This is a good thing and a bad, and it'll be on the list for the bad. But we didn't have a TV. We didn't have a cell phone reliably. Uh, no internet, you know, etc. So you kind of slow down, and it's different. We all get used to you know, tweets and text messages and everything else going on continually. And it changes your perspective when you don't have all that stuff going on. Underwater beauty, I mean, that 
we've talked about that a, a fair amount. It's pretty pretty neat. Something we don't get to experience up here. Okay, and then the opportunity, we were kind of newlyweds, and that's pretty unique to spend 24-7 with, um, with your spouse right off the bat. But it's interesting, that's a good thing, but then, you know, when you flip to the bad, it can also show up there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, we did spend a lot of time together. We went everywhere together, grocery shopping, getting supplies, making errands. Um, we found out that we tour cities differently. You know, we, I like to tour a city maybe see a couple museums, walk around, take a lot of pictures, and Mike would prefer maybe walk around a few blocks, see a few of the main sites, maybe take a picture, get an ice cream, and go back to the boat. You know, so we had to compromise a little bit on what would be our goal for today. And then also, we needed to share everything. We were at a budget, so we didn't have two, like we do at home now. We each have a cell phone. So when we were traveling, we shared. We only had one of each. The dinghy was our car. If I wanted to go and play volleyball beach, Mike wanted to stay in the boat and read. We had to share. Maybe he'd drop me off or maybe he'd come back later and pick me up. Um, if we wanted to work on the computer together, make a blog entry. Maybe I made supper while he was writing the blog and then he did dishes while I picked out the pictures. So kind of a give and take. You know, It's just like you do at home, but on the boat it was more often. But it was a great learning opportunity for us as newlyweds because it's skills that we're going to use for the rest of our life. On our trip, going cruising, we have chartered boats before in the Caribbean many times. So why, <clears throat> why was this different? Well, it was different because it was our boat. And we had never done this before. It was our home. We wanted to make sure it was safe. But everything was a little bit stressful. You know, the weather and just making sure that we didn't run aground in too bad of conditions. So we did worry, and then also, you know, what's going to happen with our jobs? Are we going to be able to make some money again when we come back? We did live by the weather. You know, we consider that we are on vacation, but not really. Every morning at 6.30, we would tune into the radio to Chris Parker, who was broadcasting from Florida, to get the forecast for the next three or four days. And the forecast is pretty important, because if a storm is coming, you want to make sure that you're anchored properly for that storm and at the right spots. Well, in the Bahamas, most of the anchorages were protection from the east winds, east or south. When a cold front comes through, it comes from the west and the north. And so that causes you to have to go to another island and anchor to have that proper protection. So we had some situations where we really learned about moving in, in advance for that cold front to happen. We did have a few weather scares. Maybe we were traveling and there was tons of lightning all over us at night or we were at anchor and there was lightning everywhere, different directions again, so we put our electronics in the oven to save them. So definitely had some storms and you know sailing in a sheet of rain and you couldn't see more than two feet or ten feet in front of you as you were trying to get to a little anchor spot to have some safety. But we made it through and as Mike was talking about too, we, we lived simply and we had, had some situations where we couldn't always call home or anything like that on a daily basis, but we got used to it. So now, okay, talk a little bit about some of the costs of what this, the, the popular question, how much does this cost? Um, so we'll start out with, we bought the boat, it was about a $50,000 boat, we resold it for a couple, th within a couple thousand dollars. We actually saw a $2,500 <coughs> loss there. And then there's a lots of other stuff associated with boat transactions. One of the big ones that we probably didn't plan for as well as we could have, or at least we're aware of it, is the commissions on a lot of these boat transactions are significant. They're usually about 10%, and that adds up uh, pretty quick. Uh, we resold the dinghy, that was another, you know, it was a brand new dinghy. Had we had more time and planned accordingly, we could have probably done better there. Um, but all said and done, you know, that's kind of a, $15,000 price point that we walked away that we didn't recover. And then in addition to that, we have the education of being a boat owner of some of the major upgrades we did. And I mean, I say that somewhat jokingly, but I mean, that is true. That I mean, we entered into this knowing we'd have to do some work and we learned an awful lot and you pay for that one way or another. But some of the big ones, we put on a new Bimini, which was great, pretty much essential uh, for kind of the 
uh, shade protection. I shouldn't say essential because we saw some friends or met some friends down there that had no sun protection, no bimini, nothing. And they were having a great time and uh, we enjoyed hanging out with them. We put on davits, that was a big item, and then some of those other uh, stuff that came out of the survey. Um, so another kind of five grand there. So 20 grand there for your you know, money flushed down the toilet, if you will. Ah, I shouldn't say that, though. Uh, but that's kind of associated with boat ownership for the year. Now, for monthly expenses, this is a little different because this is stuff you're going to be spending anyway. Um, you got to eat anyway. Uh, the other big line item unique to uh, being on a boat, and as to one of the questions over here is, we ended up motoring a lot, uh, probably more than you ever imagine in a sailboat. Um, but in general, yeah, so we were spending maybe 100 bucks, averaged out for the entire 10 months we were on there in diesel a month. But other than that, then you've got normal stuff that you're probably going to be buying anyway. And this is very unique to whatever and however you want to do a cruise. And this could be, you know, adjusted accordingly. And that's kind of the important point of all of this, is that a trip of considerable magnitude can be done on just about any budget. Whether it's going out in your canoe and cruising down the Mississippi, which we heard about and read about when uh, you know we were doing this, and you can do that obviously pretty inexpensively. Um, you know, to going out in a ten million dollar boat. And if there's any of you in the audience, let me know, and I can help out crew uh, crew for you. <laughs> um, but we saw all sorts. We saw a young couple from Canada that had come down in this tiny. It looked so small, particularly. It was a 24 foot boat that anchored next to us. And, um, you know, they were out there enjoying that just like we were. And then the, the high end is, uh, you almost don't have to mention, we saw numerous of the multi, multi-million dollar vessels down there that, you know, you can't help but kind of be envious of. But the point is, is anyone can do it, and we saw all sorts of doing it, all budgets, uh, people going all by themselves, single-handedly, um, to entire families of five on a, on a single sailing vessel. So just of all sorts. So then, what happened here? We ended up spending 10 months, but at the beginning we said we were going to do this for two years, or we were kind of planning for two years. And part of it is like, you know, what is our purpose? And, you know, once we're down there, that variety and, you know, feeling like you're accomplishing something, you know, we've accomplished it. We had uh, outfitted the boat, but now we're moved on and it's like, okay, what next? And so part of that is, you know, worrying about jobs and career and money. Uh, but then the other aspect of, you know, we have this limited amount of time off that we're taking from work, and you're limited in a boat. I mean, it's great, and you have this great sense of, you know, that you can have your island to yourself, but at the same time, you're limited to what you can touch by water or walk once you're there. And so we were kind of interested in doing a little bit more exploring of the U.S., and so we did some national parks um, while we were unemployed and... At the same time, it made sense to get the boat sold during the summer. You know, putting a boat on the market right now in Annapolis is, you know, obviously nothing's going to move quickly in the winter. So this picture depicts a, a situation where we definitely learned a lot. Uh, fortunately, we weren't going very fast when this happened, but it was a time when we were anchoring and we had a misunderstanding about what time the tide actually switch, <laughs> rising or falling tide. So um, we ran aground and we had to wait another four hours for the tide to come back up. But fortunately, we were really secure when that storm came. And we weren't moving. <laughs> so we learned a lot. Again, cold fronts and currents and tides, definitely respect those. When we traveled back to the U.S., it was three days back to the U.S., not a lot of boats around us out there in the open ocean. And we realized if we had an emergency, we might not be able to reach anybody. So if we did it again, we would go um, we were getting an EPIRB and a satellite phone to have better communication. Our boat selection for the Bahamas probably would be different. We'd go with a boat that had a shallow draft versus our six-foot draft. We would choose a boat that had a comfy cockpit in the back. And we also realized that when we were picking boats, we kind of were looking at blue water cruisers and thought we needed something that was really sturdy and seaworthy. But in the Bahamas, it's shallow water, and you're a cruiser, you're not working, you're not on a schedule. So if the weather's not right, the wind's not the right speed and the direction for where you want to go, don't go. So that way you can have a boat that 
is a little bit more comfortable and doesn't have to be that blue water cruiser. These are our dogs, and we were planning to take them with us, but we didn't have them potty trained in the month that we were planning to, and they stayed with family instead. But while we were gone, we certainly missed them. So we saw a lot of cruisers that did bring their boats and or their dogs, and next time we probably would look for an opportunity to do so. Definitely bring your hobbies. We saw people with musical instruments. So at beach bonfires, it was fun to have a guitar and bongo set playing. People brought their kayaks, you know, something fun, some more activities to get you off the boat and doing things that you usually would do at home. And we learned um, about the spears. I'm glad that I purchased a spear too. Spearing uh, was our main activity. It's something that we love to do together, and I was able to get involved as well. We learned about the locals, how they went lobster hunting, and it was a great way to see all the underwater fish. Overall, our trip was easier to do than we thought, so we're really glad that we did it. So yeah, and that's really the conclusion here, and we want to save some time for a few questions, but you can do it, and that's, that's the real takeaway. If we can do it, you can do it. And uh, you know, the, the common excuses are that it's too expensive, and I mean, again, we did it, we were extravagant compared to a lot of the other folks we saw, and, and we didn't realize that at the time, um, but that really was the case. Uh, there's a lot of social pressure that says, uh, you should be saving for retirement and putting money in your Roth, 401, blah, 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 and, you know, it's all a matter of priorities, and I hope that we have the opportunity to retire and perhaps do more of this, but we do have the opportunity now and we're young and healthy and who knows where we'll be in you know, 30 years from now. Um, there's a lot of time of that, oh man, my boat's not ready, I don't have a good enough boat, etc. And there is some type of sailing trip, well not sailing, but some type of boating trip that fits every boat, whether it's a canoe or whether it's your $10 million boat. And let me know, I'll, I'll crew on that one. Um, or perhaps you say you don't know enough. Well, we didn't know enough, and we still don't know enough. And But there's no better way to learn than to go out and do it. So seize the day, and by all means, you know, I hope you have the opportunity to do something like this as well. So we'll definitely take a few questions here. And there's some resources here that we've talked about. And if folks have specific questions, maybe that's the best way. Any questions? Uh, to start, any stories you want to hear? Yeah, the expense thing, I was looking at that and I didn't catch the bottom line. Well, how much was that? Oh, I, I, it was about, I, we were spending, I think, $1,000 a month. $1,000 a month. Um, I saw another hand. Yeah? Yeah, put, without a water maker, big water, um, rain water or something? Or? We jugged it. We had a 100 gallon tank on board. And if you stretch that, it's amazing how long you can, what did we figure? That if we wanted to, we could stretch that probably a month. That's really conservative. If you're taking, uh, we ended up using a solar shower for showering, and that worked great, and, you know, a quick little rinse off. And once we were in the Bahamas and that sun and warmth was there, it was no problem not having a hot water heater because that solar shower worked great. Um, but in answer to your question, we were, or again, in our frugal mindset, we found the few spots where we could get free water. And that usually involved carrying jugs of water um, from some spigot and taking them and dumping them in the, in the tank. I got a question for Jenny. What was it like not having hot water? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was cold. Going down the intercoastal waterway, especially when, when it was cold, um, I just broke down and said, you know, there's a marina here. I'm going to call and see what the price is on showers. And so paid for a shower a couple times on the, on the way down, or we stayed in a, a little marina. But it was really good when we got down to the Bahamas because we filled up that solar shower, and it was warm water finally. Yeah. <laughs> and for dishes and stuff, I mean, you can heat stuff on the, on the stove, and that worked well. But, I mean, it's a fairly inexpensive item, and it would probably be worth having if, you know, if we were to do it. <laughs> Peace in the middle. Sharks. Right. <laughs> when the first seen sharks whenever he was here fishing, or in the Bahamas, we would not go a day without seeing one. I mean, I think it, that's fair to say. Right. Yeah. I mean, they were extremely common, and 
it was, I mean, we were inexperienced. We didn't really know what we were doing. Uh, but we definitely got nervous on more than a few occasions. And I think it was mainly because what we were doing, you know, when we were spearing stuff, I mean, it, they're like a magnet. You know, when you have a fish that, I think it's the vibrations is part of it and then the scent of the, you know, the bloods and stuff. But, yeah, we saw a number of them. How close did they get to you? Most of them, not close. I mean, a few of the uh, words of advice that you read, that we read, is you want clear water, so, because if they know you're a human, they know you're not prey. Uh, but if the water is not clear and they can't sense that, and the water cannot be clear because it's just murky, for one, or the sun's low, or it's night, you know, obviously you don't want to go out spearing at night. Uh, but stuff like that is uh, the biggest thing. And then other spearfishing people would say that if you see a shark, don't go down and spear a fish because that's just going to bring that shark closer to you. Lobster is okay, but don't spear a fish because, you know, it's not going to be good news. Yeah, it was interesting. The lobsters didn't seem to attract them. I mean, because we'd spear the lobsters and for whatever 